Thank you, Catherine. Beautiful, as always. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. I tell you, it's just a joy every Sunday to look out and see you all. I love it. I'm Leslie Gibbons. I'm your Sunday associate this morning. And as I say, it's a joy to see you all. For anyone visiting us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. Um, we are a lay-led service this year, or a church this year. We don't have a minister. So every Sunday when you come is going to be different. It's going to be interesting, we hope, challenging, probably. And we hope that you find it so and you'll come and see us again. We're very glad you're with us this morning. Now, there is a table set up back here for coffee, as you can see. And any time after the service you want to talk to one of us, we're a very friendly crowd. I absolutely promise you that. And I might add here, with your forbearance, we might go a little over time today. Um, I hope you don't mind. I've got my eye on it. Um, but there's a lot to talk about this morning. And as you can see, we have a guest speaker this morning. We have Alex Muir. I'm very pleased to uh, have him here, very grateful to have him here. And I'll introduce him more later. And he's, um, I'm very pleased to have a guest this morning. So thank you, Alex. Thank you for being here with us. Now, let's start by lighting our chalice. First, let me ring the bell, which always signals we're about to start. Join me as I light our chalice this morning and say our opening words. You can see them on the screen behind me. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. When I first came here, every time we said the opening words, I, I thought the warmth of sharing bring us hope. And I would say hope until I realized that I was really getting it wrong. But the warmth of sharing does bring us hope, I think, as well. Now, please stand, if you are willing and able, for our first piece of music. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me, come sing a song with me, come sing a song with me, that I might know your heart, and I will bring you home, when hope is hard to find, and I bring a song of love, and roses in the winter time. 
I'll bring you hope. That's what this morning is about, I think. So we are the North Shore Unitarian Community, where our mission is to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. And we aspire to live that mission with joy and hope and love, both here in the church and in our larger communities. We're led by our eight principles, and we use and get hold of the wisdom of many sources that help guide our life paths. We meet on the shared and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people and hold a reverence and a respect for this land and for all those who hold it dear. Aware of and with respect for the past, we move forth with truth and recognition in both our words and in our actions in our diverse and very complex world. We all come from different places, different walks of life, different religions, different beliefs, but no matter how you celebrate the sacred, no matter how you experience it, we hope and we want you to feel comfortable here. Because here, together, we find comfort, and connection, and hope, and challenge, and love. We're walking our life's journey this morning side by side. And this morning, we're going to be dealing with a sometimes difficult and often challenging subject, and that is dying with dignity and using made medical assistance in dying. Now, the eventual ending of our beautiful lives and the lives of people we love, this can be perhaps the most difficult thing we face in our lives. But I know that the more we understand, the more we talk about it, the more we then can face any of the challenges that, that face us, whatever's in store for us. And I know we can face that with compassion and grace and love. We can find courage together. We can find courage individually that we didn't even know we had. And know that you this morning are held in the arms of everybody who is here. So don't hesitate to hold on to your neighbor's hand anytime you feel the need this morning. So please sit back and enjoy this wonderful piece of music about love and about saying goodbye. Life is Eternal, composed by Carly Simon and sung by our very own wonderful Allison. I've been doing a lot of thinking about growing older and moving on. No one wants to be told that they're getting on and maybe going away for a long, long stay. But just how long and who knows and how and where will my spirits go? Will it soar like jazz on a saxophone or evaporate on the breeze? Won't you tell me, please, that life is eternal and love is immortal and death is only the horizon. Life is eternal as we move into the light and the horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight, save the limit of our sight. Here on earth am a lost soul, ever trying to make my way back home. Maybe that's why each new star is born, expanding heaven's room, eternity to bloom. And will I see you 
up in the heavens in all its light will i know you there will we say the things that we never dared if wishing makes it so won't you let me know if life is eternal and love is immortal and death is only the horizon life is eternal as we move into the light and the horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight save the limit Life is eternal, love is immortal, and death is only the horizon. Life is eternal, as we move into the light and the horizon is nothing, save the limit of our sight, save the limit. Save the limit of our sight. Ah, isn't that a lovely thought? The horizon. It's just the limit of our sight. I hold on to that. I'd like to read one of the most beautiful poems ever written. It's written by Emily Dickinson. I have slightly abridged it here, but it's an introduction to this morning's discussion. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste. And I had put away my labor, and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess, in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were towards eternity. I particularly love the line, he kindly stopped for me, because that, in my experience, is the gift of maid. So I'm very, very pleased to further introduce our guest speaker this morning, Alex Muir. He is the chair of the Vancouver chapter of Dying with Dignity. And he's generously agreed to speak to us this morning about this gift and this process and the extraordinary organization. Dying with Dignity Canada has worked so hard to make this available to all Canadians. They both introduced and championed MAID at a legislative level to help all Canadians die on their own terms, in their chosen place and time. And he's agreed to stay with us for a little while after the service to answer any questions you might have, to discuss any concerns you might have, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Alex. So now I will give you the floor. Thank you, Leslie, and good morning, everyone. And thank you for having me here. I thought before we launch into a discussion about medical assistance in dying, I'd start first by telling you a few things about Dying with Dignity Canada. Um, we are a, a, a national human rights charity um, committed to improving the quality of dying so people don't needlessly suffer um, we also are committed to protecting end-of-life rights through our advocacy work and also helping Canadians avoid unwanted suffering. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. 
And we do this uh, through several initiatives. Uh, the first is that we, uh, we advocate for assisted dying rules that respect the Canadian Constitution and Charter of Rights. Um, we've been an active voice as an intervener in all the discussions uh, for years w uh, with, the, with the federal government on, on changes that Canadians want to see. We provide personal support for adults suffering from grievous and irremediable medical conditions who wish to die on their own terms. And this includes referrals to healthcare profes professionals and helping people navigate the MAID process in each of the provinces. We educate the public about legal end of life options through sessions like this, but we also have, uh, we do sessions on advanced care planning, which we think is really important. And we, we have on our website an advanced care planning toolkit. And I, I think I'll mention at this point, there is a, a, a nine page resource document that you may have received already by email. Has it gone out? Okay, um, so there, it's, it's full of resources and I'll be referring to a lot of them uh, today or some of them today. I think it's really uh, useful as an electronic document because of all the links that are in there. You just have to click on the link and it will take you to the resource because the URLs are about a mile long and, and so typing them wouldn't work very well. We also support healthcare practitioners who assess for and provide MAID. So we work very closely with the Canadian Association of MAID Assessors and Providers. So before I get right into MAID, I wanted to talk about um, where MAID fits. Um, th there are other end of life options that people have and I think it's important to know what those are. And in Canada, we were actually, f I don't know. Oh, I got to point this way. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, over the last 40 years, Canadians have slowly gained legal choice, and it's because of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we've actually seen um, a lot of um, rights articulated. And this includes, so I just want to kind of talk about what your options are. The first is uh, to die naturally. You can you know, follow the doctor's advice or don't and let, and let nature take its course. You also have the choice to cease life-sustaining or maintaining treatment. So um, you could stop kidney dialysis or you could stop chemotherapy. Um, there are some people that find that sometimes the chemotherapy is worse than the actual disease. And so this is, this is a right that, that you have. Um, there, there is a patient rights guide that is also on our website and there's a link in that document that I just mentioned. Um, the one that, we, uh, that people talk about quite a bit is the do not resuscitate order. In British Columbia, that's actually called a no CPR form. And there is an actual form on the government website. Um, it's also in that resource document. So if, that, if that's something that you want to consider, please make sure you get a hold of that form and have a look at it. Um, suicide was decriminalized in 1972. So it is something that is people can do. Um, while technically legal, it's generally a sudden drastic step taken by someone who is depressed and, and importantly, it leaves those behind in a state of shock and disbelief. And I speak from personal experience because I have a brother who died by suicide. And so um, I, I guess the point I want to make is that it is distinctly different from a med medically assisted death. And you hear the term assisted suicide used all the time, generally by people who are opposed to MAID, and that's because of the emotional baggage around that word suicide, right? So, so we don't like that term at all. Um, and, and, and when you're reading it, you should know, you'll notice, it's, it's generally by people who are opposed that use the terms assisted suicide and euthanasia because of the negative connotations associated with those terms. People also have the option of, suspend, of stopping eating and drinking and also stopping personal care. So you have the right to say, um, you know, I've had enough. And this option is often, uh, by the way, the personal care would include things like not, not being rolled over in bed, then you develop an infection and it leads to death. So th these options will lead to death. Um, however, the big difference between them and a medically assisted death is that there is suffering involved here. I mean, this takes, this will take you 
probably at least two weeks to die. It's, it's not pleasant for the individual going through it, and it's not pleasant for the family watching it happen. And what, what happens um, is, I mean, the people that choose this often are people who um, haven't considered MAID, and, so, and they, this, so this is the route that they take, or they're not aware about MAID, or they, have an, or they may have an ethical objection to MAID, and so this is, a, this is the, the route that they take. But I guess the point is that there is suffering involved, whereas there is not with the medically assisted death. The other, other option available is palliative care and sedation. So palliative care is available at, at home, in hospital, in a hospice. Um, the good news is the government has recently committed to putting more money into palliative care, which is, which is long overdue, and so we're glad to see that. And palliative sedation is when, uh, it, like it's an intentional use of drugs to basically put you into a coma, and then that it, and then it eventually leads to death. The difference, the difference between this and a medically assisted death is really who's making the decision. Often what happens is, uh, someone who is in this state is is near death already, often unconscious, and it's usually the doctor and the family that makes the decision on whether to put someone in, into palliative sedation. That's quite different from a medically assisted death, which is something that you decide. So MAID became available in, in 2016, and I want to just talk a bit about the evolution of MAID. And, and BC women uh, figure prominently in in, you know, in the evolution of made in Canada. And do, do many of you remember Sue, Sue Rodriguez? Yep. So she, this is in 1993, a 42-year-old woman in Victoria who had ALS. And she applied to the courts to uh, end her life, to, to ask a doctor to help end her life. And she asked the courts, if I cannot give consent to my own death, whose body is this? Who owns my life? This went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. She lost in a five to four decision. And she ended up actually finding a sympathetic doctor who helped end her life the following year. But what that case did is it brought the issue of, um, of assisted dying into the public arena. And people started talking about it. Surveys started happening. and. Back then, support was about 60%. It's now about 85%. But it actually got people talking about it. And what happened over the next uh, 25 years is that also the courts, um, so, so, so support for this was growing al already among the public. And then also the courts, when they were inter interpreting the charter, were saying, we need to give people more rights. And so they, so they expanded it to, they looked at liberty and security of, of the person, including end of life rights. And they said, uh, you know, this is something that we need to consider. And so that was kind of the backdrop in 2010 when Gloria Taylor and Kay Carter's families came forward with the help of the BC Civil Liberties Association and they, they challenged the existing law. And this time it went to the Supreme Court of Canada and it passed in a nine to zero unanimous decision saying we have to change the law. So what, what happened at the court, so the, the court ruling was in February of 2015 and the, the court case actually identified something called, that's referred to as the Carter criteria, which I'll talk about in a minute, and it kind of laid out the criteria for medical assistance in dying. And from, and from that, oh, and from that um, we got uh, Bill C-14 in, in June of 2016. The original legislation uh, was limited to those whose death, whose natural death was reasonably foreseeable. And that, that actually was not in the Carter criteria that got added by the politicians to get it through Parliament. And as soon as it passed, people who, who didn't fit that category said, why, aren't, why can't we access this? So there were court challenges. There was, a, there was one in BC with Julia Lamb. But the big one, which, which forced the, future, the, the subsequent changes, was the Truchon decision in, uh, in Quebec. So Jean Truchon, who had cerebral palsy, and um, also Nicole Gladue, who had post-polio syndrome, took it to court in Quebec. And the Quebec judge ruled in September of 2019 that that limitation um, is unconstitutional. You have, to, you have to change the legislation. 
And the federal government did not challenge that ruling. They agreed and they said, okay, we'll change the law. And they did. So in March of 2021, Bill C-7 came into effect and that's what expanded MAID to include uh, people whose death was not reasonably foreseeable. Oh, did, did I, I think I skipped them. Mm -hmm. so, so what is medical assistance in dying? So it's, um, it's, a, it's a planned death with the assistance of trained healthcare providers uh, who are physicians or nurse practitioners. And they are most often part of the Canadian, of CAMAP, the Canadian Association of MAID Assessors and Providers. Now in Canada, MAID can be either clinician assisted by injection or self administered by oral medication, but the medical practitioner must be in the room at the time. Now the, the use of oral medication in Canada is, is very rare. It, there's, it, it's just a handful of people each year that choose the oral medication. And the reason for that is that the injection is, is quicker um, and, there's no, and there's no way um, it can fail. Whereas with the oral medication, um, the, apparently it's quite bitter and so some people throw up or, you know, or, and then also it takes a long time, it takes at least half an hour for it to, to, for it to work. So that's why almost everyone chooses um, injection rather than oral medication. This is significantly different from the states. There are, there are 10 states that, that allow um, assisted dying in the states. And what, ha what happens down there is you get the, the prescription filled by the pharmacist and you take it home and take, take it either with or without a doctor in the room which I think there are issues there, but anyway, that's how it works in, in the U.S. The other big difference between us and the states is that everything is covered by the healthcare system in Canada, where that's, that's not the case in, in the United States. So who is eligible for Made in Canada? So you have to be eligible for publicly funded health services. So as long as you've got your MSP card, um, you, uh, you're good. And, and the reason they have that requirement is that they want to avoid death tourism. They don't want people flying to Canada to access it. So that's why you have to be um, you know, funded, you know, currently funded by uh, health services in Canada. You have to be at least 18 years of age, 18 years of age and capable of making decisions with respect to your health. And the big criteria, it has to be a grievous and irremediable medical condition. So what does that mean? So um, irremediable is determined by two medical assessments, and it means you have to have a serious illness, disease, or disability, and be in an advanced state of decline that cannot be reversed. And grievous means you have to be, and this is something determined by the patient, because everyone, everyone's pain tolerance is different, people suffer differently, there's physical suffering and there's mental suffering, and so, uh, so basically you have to be experiencing unbearable physical or mental suffering from an illness, disease, disability, or state of decline that cannot be relieved under conditions that you consider acceptable. So those are the two main cri criteria for, uh, to, to qualify medically. Um, it must be a voluntary request with no external pressure, and that's something that is tested throughout the process. Through every step of the way, you, you keep getting asked, you still wanna continue, and that, that's right up until just before the provision and you must there must be informed consent and counseling so basically you have to be advised of other means that could be used to relieve your suffering to make sure that that everything that you that that all means have been pursued to, to you know resolve your issue sorry so now we have two tracks. As I mentioned, um, under Bill C-14, we had reasonably foreseeable, track one, and then what got added in 2021 was not reasonably foreseeable, which is, which is now called track two. And I'll focus on the main differences between the two, because the eligibility criteria are the same. You have to have a signed application. You have to have a witness sign the application form. The big difference is um, in terms of the two, the, the two assessors, one of, for a track two patient, it has to be someone who has expertise in the condition. So uh, you know, it has to be someone who's a, do a doctor who's really familiar with what that medical condition is, and that way they can recommend um, you know, alternate you know, 
possible solutions that could help relieve your suffering. And the other big difference is track one, there's no waiting period. Under the original legislation, there had been a 10-day waiting period, but what they were finding was happening is people were waiting until they were right near death, then they applied, they got accepted, and then they had to suffer for 10 more days, right? So they said there's no point having that waiting period once you're assessed and approved. So there's no waiting period once you're ap approved for track one. For track two, though, there is a 90-day waiting period, and that's because that time is needed to make sure that you know all the different options have been pursued, and the assessors have to connect the person to resources that might help them um, in that in that 90-day period. The other change um, in the legislation in 2019, in 2021, sorry, was the waiver of final consent. And what that is, is someone, a track one uh, applicant, so someone whose death is reasonably foreseeable, once they're assessed and approved, they can now um, sign a, a, an agreement with, with, a, with the made provider saying, if I lose mental capacity, I want you to go ahead and, and I want you to proceed with it. That change came about because of a woman called Audrey Parker in Halifax who was going through, she had, she had uh, breast cancer which had metastasized and she went on YouTube and she was very articulate and w talked about her journey because at that time you had to have mental capacity right up until the day of provision and she said, uh, you know, I'm going to have to end my life sooner than I want to because I can't take... To, I can't risk losing mental capacity. So she actually chose to die on November the 1st, even though she had wanted to live till Christmas to spend the time with her grandkids. But she said, I can't take, this, I can't take that chance, but this legislation needs to change. And so um, as part of Bill C-7, which came into effect in 2021, um, there is a piece of it which is referred to as Audrey's Amendment, which is this waiver of final consent. And so that, that allows people now to, that, that are worried about losing mental capacity, they can actually sign this document with, with a doctor. So what you would do is, um, you could say, you, yeah, and you have to pick a date. So you pick June 30th, for example, and say, if I lose capacity by June 30th, then I want you to go ahead. If June 30th comes and you're feeling okay, then you just tear that up and you can sign another one and push it out to December 30th or something. So it, it allows people not, people don't have to die before they want to, basically is what it does. So it was a, it was a good change. Um, and confirmation of wishes in both cases. And as I mentioned, uh, um, you have to, for, for track two, they have to pursue all the different possible solutions out there. Um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about the mental illness exclusion, which has been in the news a lot in the last week. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> okay, so in BC, um, how it works is you have to, you, you, it, the process starts by completing a form 1632. It's a, it's a request for MAID. Um, there's a link also in that document which, I, which you got. Um, and this form has to be witnessed by someone. Um, now, it, it can't be someone who benefits from your death. So that generally excludes a family member. So basically you find a friend or, or a colleague or someone. Um, also, what, that's something that we do as well. We, we, we provide witnesses. I have I've personally witnessed about 150 of these for people. Um, so they come to us and they say, I need a witness and, and, and th through the health authority and, um, and we help them. The, the, the way it's structured in BC is that there are made teams within each of the five regional health authorities, and the Vancouver Coastal has a really good team, actually, and um, they are the go-to people. Uh, they um, help people through the entire process, and so they will help. So, so someone, like once you have this form filled out and submitted, they will help you find two assessors if you don't, like some people use their family doctor, um, some family doctors aren't willing or they're, they're not willing to or they um, are comfortable doing it. And so you, basically you can find other doctors instead to act as assessors. 
So you need to have uh, two assessors, and that's, that's where the MAID team is very helpful because they have a list of who the assessors are in the province, and they'll find, they'll find assessors for you. Um, I mentioned about the, the, uh, the waiting period. There's no, there's no waiting for track one, 90 days for track two. And, and you also have the opportunity to withdraw your request at any time. I'm, I, I won't get into this one. That's the actual form itself. I think I'm going to skip through that. Um, oh, question marks. They weren't, they, that must have been in the translation. <laughs> they weren't question marks before, but anyway. Um, they, they, were, they, were, they were quirky dots, actually, but anyway. Um, so practical considerations for MAID. So, you know, one of the most common questions that we get from people is, you know, what if someone in my family objects to me accessing MAID? And... I mean, the short answer is, it, this is your decision, not, not theirs. However, it makes the journey so much easier for everyone if you've got your family on side. It just, it, 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 we've, seen, we've seen the extremes, and it, it just goes so much uh, more smoothly. And there are some resources out there to help you start conversations with your family. There's a website called Virtual Hospice. Um, there's also a link in that document that went to you. To get to these um, to get to these videos, and and one of the other suggestions that people have is just write out your reasons, like why this is important to you, and get, you know give that to your family members or read it to them, or whatever, and start the conversation to try and get them to understand why this is something that you think is is really important. It makes it makes it so much easier if you know if they're involved in the process. Um, in terms of the 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 the, you know the kind of the logistics you need to think about where you want it to happen it you can some people want to have it in the hospital because they don't want to they, they don't want that they don't want their body to be at home um, other people want to be at home and so the um, the last statistics that we have this is in 2022 uh, 40 percent of people chose uh, made at home um, 30 percent in the hospital um, and then uh, Twenty percent in kind of long-term care slash hospice care is kind of the breakdown, and then ten ten percent was was elsewhere. Um, and then also think about what you want to happen. You've probably read stories about people having parties or whatever. That you know, there are lots of different um, things out there, and, and also people are there are some people that have done it in the woods or on the beach or whatever, um, and and it allows people. It, What's good about this is that because you're picking the day, it allows you to decide what you want to do in the days approaching it and how you want to say goodbye to people. And so that's something you, that you need to think about. Um, in terms of uh, the practicalities, uh, you also have to arrange for a funeral home in advance so that they know what, what to do with your body. But that's, so that's something that has to be arranged in advance. There is, um, in, in the document that, that went out, um, there's also a link to, uh, it's, it's uh, what's it called, MAID, uh, what happens on the, it's about the day of MAID, what actually happens, how the, what, the, what drugs are used, there are, four, there are four different drugs that are used, and it kind of gets into all that detail. So check that out if, if you want more detail about what actually happens. Uh, we, we can also talk about it after if you want. I've got a bunch of graphs, but which I'm not going to show you. I'm going to show you just this one for now, though, because um, I think this, one, this one's important. Um, this is from the fourth annual report on MAID. So there's a federal report that comes out every year. Um, there's a link to this report in that document that you've got. Uh, and this shows you uh, the progression, the number of people that have accessed MAID in Canada since it started. So it's gone up by about 30% every year. So there were 13,000 people in, in uh, 2022. Uh, and you know, people, you know, the people who are opposed to MAID look at this and they go, oh my God, Canada's killing off all their old people, right? And what's really happening is people are choosing not to suffer. I mean, this I think is a good thing that people are saying, you know, I, like, I don't want to suffer at end of life. And, and what's happened is there's more diet, there's no co more conversation going on about this now. I've met so many people that have a family member or know a family that's been through, um, a made death. So 
people are actually willing to talk about it now and, and, un and they understand that it is an option that you have. It, it was not the same back in 2016, 2017 when it started. It was very hush-hush and people were embarrassed to talk about it. Um, but I think it's good that it's actually out in the open and people are, are talking about it. The other thing I wanted to mention from this graph is that when MADE was expanded to include uh, track two, not reasonably foreseeable, um, there, were, there were people saying, oh my God, this is, this is the start, the slippery slope. We're gonna see, we're gonna see tons of people, you know, applying left, right, and center and dying. If you look at the numbers, the little red bar, that's track two. So it started in, it started in 2021, but 2022 was a full year of data. Three and a half percent of all made cases are track two. So, so 96 and a half are track one. So the, 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 the floodgates did not open. We did not see this huge increase. It's, track two is actually a very tough hurdle. I mean, you've got to, there's a lot of, um, cause you, because you have to show that you have actually pursued you know, all the recommended treatments, uh, it's actually, it's, it's much tougher to qualify under track two. And I'm not just, I'm gonna skip over these other ones. Um, this, this one though was interesting, about two, th two thirds, two thirds of all um, MADE recipients are cancer patients. And then um, there are a bunch of other conditions, cardiovascular, um, respiratory, neurological. The numbers add up to more than 100 because there are a lot of comorbidities. So about half the people that, that access MADE have more than one condition. And that's why you'll see those numbers add up to more than 100. But, but cancer remains the, overwhelmingly the, the most common reason. And I'm going to... Okay, so what's next in terms of the legislation? Um, what, ha what happened in, under Bill C-7 is it said, you know, there's more work required and research required in, in five areas, right? And so you see them there. Mature minors, mental illness, advanced requests, the state of palliative care, and protection of Canadians with disabilities. And they, they heard from the, the, there was a special joint committee struck to investigate these things. They heard from 150 witnesses, got 350 briefs, came up with a report uh, last February. And the one, the one that, get, that you hear about a lot and that, that there's been a lot of focus on is uh, mental illness as a sole underlying medical condition. And the reason for that is that under Bill C-7, what it said was, um, yes, we're going we're gonna to allow it, but we need two years to you know, get the processes in place to make sure that we're doing it properly. So, they set, so that was in 2021, so two years was, was March of 2023. That date approached. They said, oh, we're not ready. They pushed it out a year to March 2024. That date approached. They reconvened the committee. And as you heard this week, they're kicking it out in another three years. So, it, so that'll be six years total. And I mean, what's really happening here is um, there's a lot of controversy around this. Psych psychiatrists are split down the middle on whether or not uh, made should be available to people with mental illnesses. And I, I think what gets lost in the conversation is, is even the psychiatrists aren't focusing on who this legislation is meant for. It's intended for people who have been suffering for years or decades. They've tried all the suggested treatments and all the drug cocktails and everything and nothing has worked for them. That, that's, that's who this is meant for. Um, but that kind of gets lost in the conversation and we get, and so, and the psychiatrists are arguing you, how do you know the person's not suicidal? And yet that's an issue that's already being addressed in all these assessments that have happened. They, they, you know, they get psychiatrists involved to see whether it's just someone who, you know, wants to die by suicide. So, I mean, so there are lots of issues out there and I think it's all those issues that are forcing the deferral. The government, the government's official position was, oh, we're just not ready. And yet, the people that, I, I read the committee report, and they, they heard from 21 witnesses, 15 of them were qualified to make an opinion, to have an opinion on whether the system is ready. And 12 of those 15 said, 
at, you said, absolutely, we're ready. The other three were saying, well, well we're pretty ready, but not, we're not quite sure. Um, but overwhelmingly, they said, the system is ready. The problem is that it's all this other stuff and the, and the disagreement on whether or not um, it, it should be allowed. And so I think that's really what's driving, what's driving this. And so the, the government is just kicking it down the road. Um, and, and part of it too, I'm, I, don't think it's an, I don't think it's an accident that they're worried, they don't want this to be an election issue either. So anyway, so we think it's unfortunate for those people that, are, um, that, are, that continue to suffer. So can you receive MAID? So I just talked about this, um, that it's being deferred, but I want to, what I do want to talk about is this. Um, there's a confusion about what mental illness is. Um, so have any, any changes been made um, to include dementia patients? So this exclusion for mental illness is for, the, it's psychiatric conditions like depression and personality disorder. Those are the people that, are, that don't qualify. People with dementia, including Alzheimer's, actually do qualify today. And, so, and people with Alzheimer's have actually been able to access MAID. It's, but it's very tricky because you have to catch it at the right, at, you have to catch it at the right time. If someone is, if someone gets Alzheimer's, for example, and their condition heads south really quickly, then, then they'll lose mental capacity and then they can't qualify. So you have to catch it early enough that the assessors will say this person is competent enough to make healthcare decisions and they are on a downward trajectory and so they qualify. Um, and and the, because it is so tough, that's why we, we think advanced requests are needed and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so this is what I was just talking about. Um, the, other, the other thing that has happened, which works fairly well, is someone, uh, someone with a dementia diagnosis, Alzheimer's for example, um, if they are approved, if they're track one and they're approved, they can then sign the waiver of final consent with, their, with the MAID provider, which I talked about before, so that they can actually set a date in the future so that if they do lose capacity, they're still able to access MAID. Um, I've heard of cases where people have been approved, they don't sign the waiver of final consent they lose mental capacity, and then they've lost, they, they've lost the right, right? So it's important that if you're in that situation that you, um, you sign that waiver of final consent. So advanced requests. This was another area that, that, uh, that they're supposed to be looking at. Um, and this is something that is strongly supported. This is, this is the number one thing we hear about is advanced requests. What people want is they want to be able to say today, if, you know, if I meet these certain criteria in the future, let's, let's say I get to the point where I don't recognize my family, uh, can't feed myself, whatever, whatever you determine the criteria are, then, then I want aid. That, and that, we do not have that right now. And, but this is, this is what Canadians want. So 82% of Canadians um, want that if, if they have a medical diagnosis. Um, and even, 70, even without a medical diagnosis, 72% of Canadians say that even today, while I'm healthy, I want to be able to, I want, I want to, be able to do this. So this is something that we are fighting quite strongly for. Um, there, is, there is an e-petition right now that's, um, and, it's going to a, an MP in the Yukon, actually, he's, he's taking it to the House. Um, so if you're, this is something you believe in, I hope you'll sign the petition, it's very easy to do. Um, have the brochures, who's, yeah, if you wouldn't mind handing those out. In, in the brochure, there is a, there is a it'll, it shows you the link to the uh, e-petition. E you can also scan it, there's a QR code, you can just scan it on your phone as well, and you can do it that way as well. Um, So that's a, that's a change that we're hoping to see at some point. And because right now there is no, capa there is no capability for that. Um, mature minors was another topic they were gonna look at. Now the, the parliamentary committee said they support it. Um, recognize that today, 
uh, mature minors are able to make medical decisions, like all the, the things I talked about at the beginning, like um, suspending, suspending kidney dialysis, chemo, all that stuff, mature minors are allowed to do today. Um, I don't think this one's going to go anywhere. Um, the committee has said that they, they're recommending um, you know, five years of research, and it's a highly uh, controversial topic, and so I'll be surprised if the government does anything um, in this area. The other one was, the other area was people with disabilities, and you may have seen there's been a lot of objection from, from some communities about, uh, about MAID being available to people with disabilities. So they're recommending establishing an expert uh, re review panel, which, which by the way is what they did for mental illness. There was an expert review panel that submitted their recommendations to the parliamentary committee, and, th and this is what they're suggesting for this area as well. But it leads to the question, um, can a lack of social supports, housing disability, um, qualify a person for MAID? So you may have heard the stories in the paper about people applying because they're gonna be homeless. It's tragic, and these people are suffering, there's no question, but they can't qualify for MAID unless they meet the medical criteria, which I, I talked about. They ha you have to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. So that's the only way they can, they can actually access MAID. So despite what you might read in, in uh, you know, some of the media stories, um, people can't access it without, without, without qualifying. Um, palliative care was the other area. The government has agreed that they're gonna increase funding. So this is, this is good news. We hope, we hope that they you know, come through with the money. They've said they're going to. Um, we're waiting to see the dollars, but um, there, there is a real need for more palliative care in, in Canada, and particularly palliative care at home. I mean, it'd be, it'd be so much cheaper for, for the healthcare system if, if they would invest more money in home care and keep people out of, uh, you know, long-term care homes. Um, I'll mention this one briefly. This is also in the brochure you saw. Um, it's because it's been in the papers quite a bit as well. The BC government saw in in uh, 1995 signed an agreement with the Denominational Health Association, which is the umbrella organization for faith-based uh, um, healthcare healthcare organizations. The, the largest member by far is Providence Health. And what, the, what this agreement says is they don't have to do anything which conflicts with their religi religious beliefs. And that's why you, you, cannot get, you, you cannot get made at St. Paul's, also why women can't get abortions. Um, and so, but Providence is very heavily subsidized by the province. And even, and even looking at the new St. Paul's Hospital, which is 2.2 billion, 1.3 billion of that is taxpayer dollars, right? So is it right that they're able to uh, block access to medical services that you can get anywhere else? So we've been fighting this one for a long time and we'll continue to fight this one. Um, and if, if you feel so inclined, you can write to your MLA. There's a link in that brochure as well at, on, on how you can, uh, it, it, and it's, fa it's fairly easy to do it. It goes to our website and you just have to put in your postal code, it will come up with your MLA, and then uh, the note goes out. And you can also modify the text if you want to write your own story. Um, we, also, we, we will be launching a lawsuit um, against the government, on the, the provincial government on this. Um, and we are looking for more stories. So if you, um, what, what, what this whole thing results in is something called the forced transfer. And you've probably heard the story this, this year about Sam Elliott, 34 year old woman at St. Paul's who got transferred to VGH. It did not go well. Her parents were waiting at VGH. Um, it got, the transfer got, got delayed. She was in incredible pain. So they had, to, they had to medicate her more. By the time she got to VGH, she'd lost consciousness. Um, so she never, but she had signed a waiver of final consent with, her, with the maid provider, so they went ahead with it because she had that waiver of final consent. But she never got to say goodbye to her parents. Anyway, so, so th these are the sorts of things that happen um, because, you, you know, people who are, find themselves stuck in these institutions can't access me. And I, 
uh, just rural access. It's yeah, it's a challenge for in some parts of BC. We're pretty we're pretty we're pretty lucky in Vancouver in terms of the resources that are available. It is tougher. Um, the one good thing that happened with COVID was um, they they allowed um, virtual witnessing, which we still have. So people you can actually do it across on the computer with someone. I did one just last week, um, and also virtual assessments with doctors, which is even more important. So people in rural communities can actually, they can actually get assessed and approved uh, over the computer instead of having a doctor come to them. And those are just some, some phone numbers. Uh, you can also, through that document that I sent, you can access our website. Uh, we have a support line in, uh, in, uh, in Toronto. And they're very helpful, so you can send an email or phone them if you, if you have any questions. And that's me. Um, so you can also send me an email if you have any questions. There we go. Thank you so much for that, Alex. Thank you. Now, please sit back and enjoy another piece of music uh, with an Irish lilt, but sung by our own uh, Deanna Diaz. It's very beautiful. Written by Claire McGuire called, This Is Not The End. Be your will to speak of memories we often shared. Talk to me of days gone by. Think of love and no despair. And when I'm gone, we'll meet again As so often do the closest friends So dry your eyes and lay me down I'll tell you this is not the end I need someone I'll wait and I will understand A heart of thorns must leave the mind But when in time I see your face The stars will fade, the heart will mend So try
Thank you. Thank you. Every Sunday, we walk through those doors carrying our joys and our sorrows, our fears. Some are holding love, some are holding grief in their hearts. And I'd like to take a few minutes here to acknowledge any cares and joys that are being held in our congregation this morning and light a candle to acknowledge those thoughts. Some are held so quietly and gently and are often unspoken. And my thoughts this morning also go to those outside our warm community, those who are facing hardship and pain, illness, even war. There are places where humanity seems to have disappeared. So I would also like to light another candle, a candle of global concerns this morning, and have a moment of silence as we send our thoughts to those people who have a need and are in trouble. Please pray in whatever form that takes for you as Unitarians. Whatever form you need, pray for peace to settle on our very troubled world. And now, please stand, as I am sure it's time for you to do. Stand and we can sing together, we laugh, we cry.
Thank you all. I invite you now into the spiritual practice of generosity. Today, our offering will be going to Dying with Dignity Canada. And as Alex has so wonderfully told you, their mission is to ensure access to quality end of life choices. So thank you, will the ushers please come forward. Thank you, thank you all for your generosity and for, oh, yes, I have a question here. I'm sorry, Can, would you like to come up and say that in the mic, because you were very hard to hear. You're most welcome to do that. <coughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you very much for the gifts that you brought today and then also that dying naturally can also be a gift and there can be a gift in suffering as well or the gifts that come with the suffering. Thank you for that. We love to hear everybody's point of view here which is why we're Unitarians, right? So thank you and thank you for all you all you do to create and min maintain this wonderful community that we hold together. Thank you for everybody who helped put on the service this morning. Thank you, Alex, again. Thank you. I have just a few announcements, and I'm aware of time, so I, um, you'll see some up on the screen here. But I do want to mention that next Saturday is Nancy McMaster's uh, Celebration of Life. Uh, all the information you'll find in your bullet, um, but it will be here, of course. And I do want to mention, sorry news, that Martha Veerman has passed away. And some of you may know, but we learned this week, she was a founding member of NSUC, and she passed away on January 23rd. And there is no service planned at this time. So other news you'll find in your bulletin, and I think if it's all right with Allison, we will not sing one more song. And I will just offer you now some closing words. Because I'd like to share with you my own experience with MAID. As many of you know, my late husband, Maurice, chose to die with dignity and with love. He had Lewy body dementia. And his was a gentle, parting. It was a loving gift he gave to me and his family. It was a loving gift to leave us so gracefully. Because made is a loving gift. It's a gift from the giver and it's a gift from the receiver too. Maurice gave me a gift. He gave me a gift by dying so beautifully and so gently 
And that's a memory that I can hold in my heart every day. And my participation in it allowed me to embrace it with him. I promised him that I would hold him in my arms when he left on his journey. And he died in my arms. And you know, he was so excited. He, those of you who know Maurice know he was excited to take that journey because he was done with this one. And he woke up one morning and he said to me, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. True Unitarian that he was, he thought there just might be something waiting for him. Didn't know what. But he really did think that there was. And from the moment when he told me of his decision to go, I recognized his gift. And I made sure every moment from that time on was a superb one, as you, many of you witnessed. That was my gift to him. I wasn't going to moan and cry and groan and say, oh, what am I going to do without you and you can't go? I may have felt that, but I wasn't going to let him see that, none of it. His last weeks and days together with me were filled with laughter and a celebration of the life we had had together. <laughs> and I mean, he lived an outrageous life, as many of you knew. We laughed at the absurdity of life, at the absurdity of our fights, because we had lots of them. I remember leaving several times and would come home to a banner saying, please, come home. Sometimes we just sat and we held on to each other. And as that beautiful song said, and he believed, this is not the end. And I chose to believe that with him too. Because it takes courage to die. It takes courage to accept the death of someone you love. And it takes love to send them off with a kiss and an embrace. And it takes love to leave so calmly. And these are the gifts of Maid. So we can extinguish our flame. If you would repeat the words you see on the screen. We extinguish this flame. The world calls us to live with depth and meaning and purpose. We forth Please stand and hold hands, touch elbows, and sing our closing song together.